everybody, and welcome to a uh, OpenShift Commons gathering on community development. If you joined us a little bit earlier, we had a slight technical snafu with the sound, but other th than that, um, things are going um, wonderful this morning. Thank you for joining us. If you've been to an OpenShift Commons gathering before, you've probably um, come for the tech. Um, usually we do OpenShift Commons gatherings around Kubernetes and KubeCon or Red Hat Summit or around a theme like machine learning and AI or um, Telco or Edge or one of those things. And usually you'll hear a lot of um, engineers and technical folks talking about the latest and greatest technical releases and things like this. And you'll also hear a lot of people like myself who are the community development people that help to build um, the communities around this, these technologies. And so today, um, we're going to do something slightly different. We're going to be talking about developing the communities around the technologies and how we do that, um, what some of the best practices are, and all kinds of interesting conversations should arise from that. And I'm really pleased today um, to have with me um, my colleague and uh, fellow researcher in this ar arena, Daniel Esquerdo from Biturgia. I want to say hi, Daniel, and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here with, with you all. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Diane, for this, for this opportunity. Uh, so be about me. Uh, well, I have to say I met the first time, Diane, in 2014 in OpenStack Summit. Uh, yeah, in Paris. And that was the first time I, I heard about OpenSafe and OKD and, and, and the project itself. And since then, uh, yeah, since then we, we've been collaborating together and advancing in the, in, in the research and the work we've been doing together. So a bit about me, I'm one of the founders of Viteria. We started in 2012. Um, we, we do, uh, software development analytics at the scale. So that means that we can analyze any size project that matter to you. And in this case, what matter for today is, uh, well, we will discuss beyond these walls, but is OpenShift and CNCF ecosystem. So, um, yeah, lately during, uh, during the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to, to join the Chaos project as well. So, uh, the technology we are developing, of course, is open source remote lab as part of this project Chaos. And we'll have an introduction and, and what health means by, by the chairs of the project, Matt German Prey and, 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 and Georg Link. Um, so I'm a board member there, and then I, I, I had the opportunity to serve as a member of the board of directors at the Inner Source Commons that we'll, we'll discuss about the Inner Source as well. So this is me, and really happy to be here. So part of the reason that Daniel and I um, are, are in this together is um, in, we wrote an article a few uh, almost a year ago now about um, moving from art to science when it comes uh, to community development and uh, so we've been having these long discussions and doing a lot of work around um, understanding and analyzing who's in the community um, that we are working in. And um, it actually is really not about an individual community. It's about the massive cloud native ecosystem and all of the people. And if you read the article or if you've seen our talks on this, um, this is what I call the jellyfish diagram, so you'll see it quite often. And each one of these little dots here represents a person um, in some GitHub repo who's posted an issue, or a you know, full release, or a full full request, or merge, or documentation, or some some issue on a mailing list somewhere, and how they're all interconnected with each other. Each of the large bubbles represents different projects, whether it's etcd or Kubernetes or OpenShift, and um, so we've been busy working uh, together, mapping out all of the relationships and using that to really um, drive um, a, a conversation about how to understand how communities work and how they're interrelated because we're really kind of on it about um, cross-community collaboration. So um, the other part of this puzzle is that there was a conference that was going to happen at ChaosCon in Austin. So we started this little conversation, Daniel and I, because ChaosCon got canceled, that we th thought, um, and we had a paper accepted, so we were going to go and talk there, that it would be, that what we were missing were the hallway conversations. Um, since we're not, we're, everybody's virtual now, we don't get to meet our fellow community development folks um, and dev relations folks um, that, you know, we normally would get to um, 
either browbeat or ask for insights into what they're doing and how they're working on things. So we really had uh, to really figure out a way to, to revive that piece of the puzzle that helped us understand what was going on um, and the coaching that we got from our fellow folks out there who are doing this. So um, we really kind of started to think about how we could set up something. And so today is really about having a very long conversation, um, eight hours, with everybody that we would have liked to have seen at KubeCon in person, um, in the hallway, or at Red Hat Summit in person, um, or at ChaosCon, or any of the other con uh, uh, events that are getting, you know, kind of side side pushed aside for uh, virtual stuff. And now we know this is virtual. Um, we're streaming it on Twitch and YouTube and on Facebook, and it, it all is going to be recorded. And we will be um, pushing it up on the YouTube channel afterwards in chunks so that you can digest it at your leisure. But our goal really is to kind of have the equivalent of a DevOps day or a GitOps day for community devs. So maybe a community dev day is kind of how I'm, I'm thinking about this. And um, today's focus is really on creating inclusive and diverse and connected um, and hopefully healthy communities of all types. Um, the stuff that we do in, in business and technology, all of us um, have years of experience uh, working together to build communities around technical um, and technology um, initiatives. Um, and, and most of us, outside of our work lives, bring those skills to other initiatives. And there's lots going on in the world today um, and that we try and take, hopefully, what we've learned and using at work and apply them to things that are happening in the real world or the, um, the, the ever-changing world and um, bring more diversity and inclusivity and be better allies for um, other people out there in the world that, that need help and need um, our support. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is really um, the diversity and the health of communities, how do um, the lessons that we've learned over the years, really pushing the edge there and trying to get um, some of the experience from the massive amount of uh, community leaders who have volunteered to show up today and, and talk about it. Um, what the best practices are, what the lessons they've learned, um, how to measure health of a community, how to be a really good ally. Uh, we've got some great talks coming um, all day long. Um, so please, um, if you have to drop out um, for an hour or two, come back um, and be part of this conversation. The way it's going to work, eh, hopefully, uh, is if you're listening to this in Twitch or on YouTube or on Facebook, or I think he's even streaming it to Periscope, um, I have no idea um, where that where that is. But all of the questions and the chat is aggregated and shared with us in the, um, we're using blue jeans under the hood so that the speakers can get your questions and answer them. And I've staged the day so that what we'll have is a talk by one of um, the many speakers to set the conversation, um, to set us up for about a 30 minute um, AMA session or ask me anything session after that um, conversation. So we have a really kind of tight schedule, um, but I'm gonna say that it's gonna be a fluid day. So uh, obviously we're running a little bit late already. Um, we have some really amazing people that um, have decided that, that they're willing to, to share their experiences with us and tell us their stories. Um, Liz Rice will be joining us shortly to talk about um, incubating cloud native projects. Uh, she's the chair, uh, current chair of the uh, CNCF's uh, TOC or Technical Oversight Committee with a number of SIG leaders um, from, from the CNCF. Um, I've decided to start stage the day so that it would start off with something really pragmatic, something that we really, um, most of us uh, who are on this call probably hold near and dear to ourselves is the cloud native ecosystem, which the majority of us probably are members of. And then a um, colleague of mine, Jay Bloom um, from Red Hat and Dimiji Onofua from Microsoft, um, who have been working together and are researchers in design. Um, and it's not in design as in furniture, but as design as a real conceptual thing, are gonna um, try and bring us through 
through a, a conversation about um, what we call recommoning communities, and he'll explain that concept and talk a little bit about um, allyship as well. And so we'll have a conversation with them about that as well. And then we have folks from um, the Chaos Conference. Um, Jorg and Matt um, are going to talk a little bit about what Chaos's initiative is, what their practices are, and then we have a number of folks who have been working closely with them who are going to be available um, in the chat for that. And then in the afternoon, um, if all goes well, um, starting at 12.30, um, Tamao Nakahara from Weaveworks, who most of you probably have run into at some conference. Um, we've been colleagues on the road, and she's worked with everybody from Pivotal to Weaveworks to, uh, you know, a huge amount of people in the dev relations space. Um, it's very important to me that we um, do talk about um, DevRel um, as part of community building. Um, we have lots of people who have huge careers and have done lots of great work um, building up um, through developer advocacy and evangelism or however you call it at your company. But there are a lot of the faces of who people meet to learn about our tech, and they also do a, have an important role. Um, and then um, Tari Carez from OpenStack Foundation is going to talk with us um, about some of the lessons that they've learned um, and where the OpenStack Foundation is going um, and what their journey has done, because I think we can learn a lot from, from what we've what they've done there and how they've reinvented themselves. We've had one um, slight cancellation. Um, Josh Simmons at the last minute um, had a, an issue and can't join us. So um, we're gonna see if we can get Hong or Ilana to step up and, and give his talk, but otherwise we'll turn the, um, the 2.30 into a panel. And then we have some closing remarks around um, what we're doing here. Um, and what we're going to do next after this event. So um, just a quick word about the AMAs. Um, they're Ask Me Anythings. If um, you've ever been on Reddit, um, they can get pretty interesting. Um, we have three live streams going on today. The conversations are open to everyone. There is no price tag on this. It's precious. Um, and we can, um, we'll be aggregating the information and putting them in. We do request your patience as we learn the ropes of this new uh, virtual conferencing process. Um, as you can see, we're we're already running a little bit behind, and um, we've had some issues. So if you can just type it into the um, the chat wherever you're watching this, um, we are watching the chat channels, and we will um, try and um, aggregate all of your questions and get them answered. We do have a code of conduct. Um, it's really be kind and respectful. We know this is virtual. It is open to all. We're really dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for all the participants of our events. Um, and we really ask you to um, behave in accordance with professional standards and um, if you know, respect your employer's policies and, and all the governing appropriate workplace behavior and applicable laws. And if you have questions about that, you can click through. We're going to try and imitate the uh, Linux Foundation's of conduct for today. So really, um, Demidji, who is going to be one of the presenters later today, um, we are going to really um, lean on a lot of folks um, here from that, that huge group of folks to lend us some of their privilege, um, provide some narratives, and hopefully keep them honest about the lessons they've learned and their biases and all of that um, wonderful um, information that they have about building communities um, and try and share that with everybody. Um, as I always say, my goal is to not talk, um, is to give away the podium. Um, but I think in this, this case, um, really what we're trying to do is use the tools and the privileges that we have um, as employees at some of the major corporations building the tech to um, empower other people. And um, really, as, as Dementia says, is really refuse to stay silent. Create spaces for people to share the information and hopefully build um, better communities, stronger communities, and, and keep them engaged and healthy. So with that, um, I'm going to pause and let Daniel fully talk for a few minutes. Uh, I would like to stress the, this idea that we have in the title for today, Offensive Commons Gathering on Community Development, and it's not community management, because the idea is that we are moving from a world where communities were a couple of hundred of people involved, having having in mind everyone. So you, you can you can you can uh, uh, 
know all of your uh, community members, so you are all kind of a big community, but now uh, moving to a massive community as we have nowadays, for instance, CNCF ecosystem, uh, that we, we can we can have a look at the landscape, right? So it's like, that's the point where we need to go and move uh, to a more data approach, data-driven driven approach, so that's, that's why this is happening. But in any case, uh, I'd like to say, and I think this is this is uh, really really important that we, uh, this is all about the members of, of those communities. It happens that with the tools that we have nowadays, we can we can we can help each other and reach out other members and newcomers and, and try to speed up the onboarding process, have uh, more uh, uh, inclusive communities and diverse communities and. And thanks to the data and the tooling, this is this is the way we can proceed nowadays. So yeah, yeah. I would, I would like to, to bring another an, an, an anecdote here because the um, so we when we were presenting this paper that this is this is based in previous work we were doing together. So this is about uh, the the OpenShift and CNC ecosystem what we were analyzing. So if you remember that uh, that that chart that we had before that jellyfish the, the really big one star was the was Kubernetes right. But then at the bottom, one of the big ones were OpenSea. Um, so then in, in OpenSea, that is, is what, what matters in this case to, to Diane or one of the projects that matter to her. Uh, the interesting thing here was that we, we wrongly assigned the, the organization of a given developer. And then it happened that uh, given the connectors that Diane has in the community, it was really uh, interesting that that guy uh, was finally introduced to Diane through some other uh, community members in this case, as far as I remember, Red right Hatters. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the chat. Um, and now, then, then we discovered by then that this 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 uh, this person was coming from another company, and then that company is one of uh, these large corporations in Asia. So they were kind of you know, trying the technology and so on because this was, as far as I remember, we found this in in uh, in OKT in the corporate. Well, I, I don't exactly remember, but the point was that. Even given this uh, misunderstanding that we had with the data, because we wrongly assigned the name of that person uh, to a specific organization, then we realized that that person was coming from this large corporation. So suddenly, this is like, oh, we have these people uh, trying or checking the technology, and that's really, really, really interesting. So, what can we do from a, from a community perspective to have a really onboarding and fast process to, to have these new people? uh quickly helping and dealing with the community and knowing each other and so on so it's true that we have this massive community that you see now in front of your uh of your screen but then each of the dots are the important ones and then we have connectors we have member we have mavens we have important people dealing here and there so that's that's the interesting thing uh there was a harvard business review article um and it was very much focused on um continuous connection with customers. And um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, cross-community collaboration and the, you know, from the, the diagram that you saw with the jellyfish there, um, you know, how, how is one who is a community development person supposed to um, manage all of those connections and understand those and keep up with those and, and keep and nurture those and nudge those things. and in a world in which there are so many ways to connect and there's 24-7, 365 global um, connections that we have to nurture. And so what does it mean to be developing global communities that are touching on all of these different um, pieces and parts of ecosystems in today's um, world? And the, the link to the, the Harvard Business Review article is, is right here. Um, underneath, um, so I encourage you to read it. It is very much um, customer focused. But what I kind of um, was trying to, to frame out as a conversation piece is the recognition that we are really now in continuous relationships with all of our community participants. Whether it's um, if you're still in the old days and, and loving IRC um, and trying to connect IRC with Slack so that you're only in one space, or you're on Stack Overview or you're in GitHub and in GitLab and doing issues and all kinds of other um, tracking stuff. There's there's so many ways from TikTok to uh, Snapchat to who knows what to connect with each other and to reach reach each other and to share information. 
and um, really try and figure out how we build um, better conversations around um, getting the um, information out there to people um, and nurturing those in a healthy way that um, shares the podium with everybody in the community because um, we know the internet is not distributed equally. Um, so um, one of the things that that um, the article says and, and drink or want, read the article with a, a block of salt or a, a cup of tea or something like that um, because it is very customer focused. But I think the interesting thing um, that they they mentioned here was from a customer's point, when the customer recognizes they need or a community member recognizes they need something from the community, whether it's technology, documentation, or they, you know, they need to give you feedback um, and they make a request and um, then you fulfill it in some way and then they respond to the fulfillment and then it's a, this cycle of um, you know, recognize, request and respond and repeat. But in order to do all of that, um, we have to really understand where these connections are, who they are, and how they are all connected and, and how they respond um, to each other. Still not seeing, Liz didn't get in yet. I'm pausing for a minute just to check. Um, to really see um, how to do that as um, effectively and appropriately and as quickly and seamlessly as possible. And that's that's really kind of one of the crazy things about this world is that there's an expect, expectation that one as community managers or architects or DevRel people that we we know all these connections, we know all these people and we have this massive Rolodex in our heads and it's almost, it's impossible to, to get there. So one of the things that um, we really, we're trying to tease out today um, in our conversations and maybe setting the stage here um, by doing this talk first, um, we'll kind of set the stage for some of our other conversations as well, is really how do we develop um, effective and inclusive connected strategies? Um, because there's there's a lot of things um, that we touch on um, and often we, um, as community development people don't use all the same tools as someone would use in business development or in um, uh, sales or marketing and that like that. We tend to not um, take on some of the automation and the pieces um, to do that, but with this new world, we kind of have to make sure that we are um, responding to these desires to participate or desires for information or desires to contribute to, to information. Um, to the, the initiatives that we're part of. Um, and one of the, the aspects that they talk about in the Harvard um, article was about um, creating and tailoring curated offerings. And I think that was one of the things that struck me is um, often in, when we're in a technology community, we overwhelm newcomers with a ton of documentation or um, a demo that's a deep dive or something and we're trying to give them everything we can when we don't really segregate them out by the, what their needs really are and trying to create more curated offerings that we can use. And then um, there was a lot of conversations and I think we all do this is um, trying to coach good behavior um, and to get people to contribute. There's a lot of work that we can do in terms of coaching and nudging people, especially after they've made that request and you've responded to it, um, often we see people fall off um, and go quiet. We don't know, we don't follow up enough. So it was interesting in this article to me um, that one of their, their keys was to try and figure out some what they call automatic execution and that just reminded me of the, uh, the automate all things um, kind of conversation that we have um, about uh, in, in technology and with CI and CD pipelines and this whole move to for testing and everything, that it's the same kind of processes um, we need to put in place. But in some ways, um, and as we've all been inundated with marketing and, and all kinds of strange things that come into our email boxes, it's really important that we still humanize the relationships as well to maintain this, these contacts between folks, to use the technology but not to be used by it and make people not make people feel like they're being marketed to 
um, in these community events. So that's been one of the things um, that, I, that I'd like to tease out today in some of the conversations that we're having um, around um, using the, the technology um, that other people use across our businesses um, to use in our community development efforts. And I think a lot of us have used some of them, but um, we haven't really done it in a practice measured way um, to a lot of, the, to the large extent. So some of the questions that, um, that I ask is uh, of myself and others when, they're, when I'm coaching them on building communities is, when do you first recognize someone as a participant in your community? Um, and by this, I mean, it's like, when, you, when they come in, um, is it a stack overflow question that they're asking? Is it their boss told them that they had to go figure out you know, how to become a cloud native? Um, or is it just a cursory, I'm in the Slack channel, or I've tweeted something, or what, what is that potential point of entry into your community? And when do you actually, as a community person, um, flag them as someone who's a participant? Uh, in the community. And often we don't do that until it's um, they've already done an issue or uh, logged an issue in GitHub um, or made a um, given feedback or attended a conference or something. But it could be as simple as a tweet or something like that. So when you start to look at who is actually in your community, it becomes a really kind of an interesting concept of when they actually touch into your ecosystem and the different roles they have from end users to um, uh, service providers to engineers to maintainers to you know all the different roles that we have. So I think one of the things that we, in order to do this kind of thing, we have to really get better about um, the metadata um, that we collect and how we classify um, participants. Because there's participants on the edge that sometimes we don't recognize. The other thing that we've done, and if you're part of OpenShift Commons, um, we've kind of, and this is probably going to be the most controversial thing I say, is de-anonymize a lot of folks. Some of the work that we've been doing, um, it's uh, a lot of the folks that participate in um, OpenShift and Kubernetes are um, using, uh, are not, a, not are unaffiliated, um, and a lot of the tools that we have today um, are make it rather easy to De you know, to add their affiliations and so we can figure out where they're from. And one of the things that we did with the commons, which made a big difference um, for us, is we asked people when they join commons to use their uh, corporate or their organizational email addresses. Um, so if you're in the common Slack, for example, um, you're probably using your the affiliation that you want to be affiliated with um, as your um, email address so someone could see in Slack what the luggage is or the baggage is or your um, your your corporate master is um, so that it's identifiable. And that made, made it really easy for people to find each other and have these conversations in a more trusted way. And I'm not sure everybody agrees with me on that, but um, it is one of the things that's really, I, I believe, has helped us um, in the recognition of the participant to help participants recognize each other. Um, and so this is, you know, this is this is kind of um, an interesting way to, to segue into this conversation is um, is to figure out the very first touches that we have um, with these these com these companies. Yeah, so, there is. There, uh, yeah. Diane, sorry for interrupting. So there is there is a really interesting experiment that they are running at the ASF. So there are other communities I'm aware they are doing this, but this is. This is this uh, friction lock that interns, for instance, coming from Outreachy or Uber Summer of Code need to fill just in order to understand how the process of onboarding process, how to start from scratch is 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 felt, let's say, by, by a newcomer in that community. So I don't know if this is something that you have at the OpenSeed Commons. Yeah, we do have an interesting onboarding um, approach for Commons itself in that when a new, we, we consider ourselves an organizational based um, community. So we would then, um, if someone joins, say, from Toyota or a Honda or something like that, um, they join once for all of Toyota, then anybody can join. 
um, from Toyota, from the CEO to um, a janitor. It doesn't really matter to us what your role is at the company. You can join as long as you use your um, your corporate email address. It's an automatic um, add into the Slack channel and the mailing list. Um, so there's 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 that um, self identification. Um, so that's I think is that answering your question? Um, yeah. So I, I uh, well kind of. So the idea is if if you are uh, let's say a newcomer uh, for for certain technologies might be OpenSea for instance. Uh, question is how how can I uh, be help? So are there specific mentors for instance in the community? Are there specific people helping in this process? Because we were, I, I just have in mind that we we ran a specific analysis for the OpenStack uh, community a couple of years ago about mentorship, um, and then in in that analysis, of course, we we were analyzing around 40 different interns that they had over the years. Um, we we cannot compare 40 people against thousands of developers or community members that there are uh, that there are in the community, but. What we found, that at least as starting a starting point to, to dig a bit more into that, is that uh, those people that were mentored tend to be longer than the usual average in the community. So that means that perhaps having a mentorship process, uh, some coach process, etc., might be helpful for uh, those newcomers because they will have this sense of community. Uh, even more nowadays, where it seems that the face-to-face -face meetings and, and so on are kind of moving to virtual meetings, this one, for instance. So uh, I was wondering if in the OpenSea there's something similar. Hmm. Um, there's there's a couple of um, things that we do when we do onboard folks um, for this is that we ask them to first um, add in to come and do an introductory briefing. So at, in Commons, one of the first things that we do is um, schedule a session with them to talk about either what their role is in the community, if they're if they're building a product that integrates into OpenShift, or if they're an upstream project lead, we make them give a talk um, on, on that um, as a way to introduce themselves to the rest of the community. So that's um, one of the, the tenets of um, the Commons is give away the podium and then and give them a way to be recognized in the community for what they do and where their contributions are or, or how they participate in the ecosystem. And then the other thing that we do is on an ongoing basis try and rinse and repeat that. So we'll try and get them to do one introductory one and then we'll get them to do something that's a um, follow up maybe with someone who's an end user that's implemented their technology or a customer of theirs or some other aspect of um, their their technology used in place at some in some production way and then we we always offer to do a follow up on that with something that is a um, you know a new release or a new uh, piece of the puzzle that uh, that they can they can then um, update the information that they did in the introduction. So we try and um, allow them to create some content that makes it easy for the, the rest of the community to um, get an introduction to what they're doing. Um, it doesn't work all the time because right now I think we have around just under 560 member organizations and one of my goals this year had been to try and get every single one of them to um, do an update. Um, and there's only 365 days in the year, so that's not quite going to happen. Um, but we try and, and get as many of them in as possible at, at there. And then again, at the gatherings that we do, like with this one, we try and, and pull people in to um, make them part, participate in some some small way in this um, in the community as well. So um, that's you know one of the things we're really adamant about is. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny because here I am running on, is it not being Red Hat um, always talking um, and the voice of the commons. It's really the commons is about um, the community and where the community um, touches on OpenShift, Kubernetes, or any of the upstream projects and, and how they relate it. So that's been been quite an, an interesting set of um, briefings that, that you can, anyone can find them on YouTube. They're all in the public. Um, and if 
anybody who's listening here wants to to be part of that, they're they're welcome to do so. I'm going to pause here for a minute to see if any of the other participants who are um, listening in um, for the speakers today um, would like to to get in on um, the AMA here. Um, I know we hadn't we're putting you a bit on the spot, um, but there's a bunch of you who who might have other um, things to contribute here as well. Um, while we get ready to stage for our um, our next talk, so if you're if you're interested in that, I can unmute you and you can add into the conversation. And are there any questions coming in from the um, from the Twitch or Facebook streams? Yeah. Um. I'm going to unmute the folks who are going to be the speakers at the um, on the other section here and see if they will join us. So Aloise and I'm not sure if Brian and Aaron and the folks who are here. So there is there is a question from the, the audience. Uh, oh. oh yeah, Chris already shared this here. So. Yeah. All right, well, it's, it's Karen is asking, are you working with the existing communities? We are a 2100 plus people strong community of cloud native devs. Um, we are, so the diagram, if you draw this back here, I'm just gonna go back to this beautiful hole here. This diagram from here, um, it was part of um, one of the things that was really interesting to myself and to Daniel about the community um, issues here. Um, and I'm just gonna unmute some folks here if they would care to, to dive in here, um, they're welcome to. Is that we, and Brian and the folks that were going to be part of the CNCF one, and this kind of gets us back to the CNCF. All of these bubbles here in this thing represent um, and, I, and I think you might be talking about the cloud native one, but the cloud native community is much bigger than 21,000, uh, 2100. Um, but what we've been trying really hard to do is to um, make sure we understand um, all of the relationships between all of the different communities. So we are working really closely, um, especially from an OpenShift perspective with all of the people in the um, cloud native ecosystem whether it's um, you know, the different operator frameworks or uh, Prometheus or any of the, the open source projects that are part of um, the open source um, cloud native ecosystem, as well as if you, anyone has ever looked at the cloud native uh, landscape diagram, uh, thank God it has filters on it, but it is a rather busy um, environment here. And so part of the scene, we didn't, for some reason, Liz Rice hasn't been able to join us today to give her short talk on, um, on the CNCF's incubation process. But I think one of the things that's really um, been interesting to watch is the development of um, the incubation process for the CNCF and the sandbox processes for the CNCF and how they've, they've been growing and changing those processes um, and leveraging um, the SIG, the special interest groups, to do the review and to offload some of the work from the TOC into the SIG so that there are more eyeballs reviewing and doing due diligence on new projects coming into this ecosystem. So um, we have with us a couple of folks, um, uh, actually three, Aaron and um, Aaron Boyd, Brian Lills, and um, Eloise Reitenbauer, I think I said that right, um, who are all SIG leads um, at diff in different pieces and parts of the um, CNCF. I'm wondering if each of you might talk a little bit about the roles that SIG plays in, in helping this cross-community um, collaboration um, with other existing communities and the new ones. I will unmute you. Aaron and Aloise and Brian, you are now officially unmuted for the AMA. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is a this is an interesting topic. 
Uh, I actually broached this topic last year at KubeCon on the main stage um, towards the end of a keynote where I was talking about uh, about communities just in general in the ecosystem. And, and I think one thing that we fail quickly on is we think that the community is just a plane, like a horizontal plane, but we all work for these big, massive companies who make so much money and employ us. Um, so there's vertical segments to this too. So really when we, when we think about community, there's the, the ecosystem, uh, all the things that we need to keep this thing going. So whether it come up from Linux to Kubernetes to the cloud native that's baked on top. And then there's also, but then there's what your company or your, your, your project contributes. And it might just be a smaller um, sliver or a silo. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that companies can be profitable in this realm, because if they're not, it goes away. But we also need to make sure that we don't break the community. The, uh, in a lot of cases, um, CNCF helps with these protocols that, and CNCF and Kubernetes project offers these protocols which we can, we can all get together and work to build these things. But then um, uh, outside of that, there's groups like um, Red Hat and Operator Framework. They're free to explore and build on this space. And hopefully if they have a good enough solution, people will use it and it doesn't hurt anyone else. And I just think that whenever we're thinking about communities, uh, we think about it in more than one plane. And I'm sure there's even more planes than two that I raised. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a good point. And uh, one, I always sort of jokingly refer to it as our corporate masters um, at, that, the acknowledgement that there are a lot of companies who have a lot of stake in the game, um, and but they're all there's, the other side of it is they're also funding a lot of the engineering resources that go into work on these projects, and I think that is the the amazing thing. Um, they're not all reinventing the wheel, um, but they are making different wheels, um, and so it's it's kind of the 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 processes that the CNCF has put in place. Um, and we'll hear some more from, you know, Terry Carreras later on in today about how OpenStack um, did some of that work and how they've, um, the lessons that we've learned from them as well. But I think it's an interesting, um, it's it's never one di one dimensional or even two dimensional. It's like this multi-dimensional chess set um, trying to keep all of the um, the players in these communities I can keep track of them. And I think that's one of the things that's really important in that the CNCF gets right um, a lot of the times, not all of the time, but I think their use of the SIGs um, has really helped um, at least um, getting some of the early projects and initiatives, um, a you know, I, again, I say, giving them the podium to share um, what they're doing and talk about it and influence and maybe find other collaborators to work on similar things. When, Aaron, Aloise. Sure. So um, I'm on the I'm the co-chair for the CNCF storage SIG, and I think it's been great because for a long time the TOC didn't have a representative that was SME in storage. So I think it really gave a a good place for projects that even were in a tinkering stage or a thoughtful stage to come with like-minded people, talk about their ideas, talk about their project, like you said, get other people involved across the community. And we've seen a lot of very early projects come through that process and, um, you know, go from sandbox to incubation by doing that. And so I, I, I love the idea of the SIGs not only offsetting just the work, but providing, um, kind of a, a diverse environment of people and users to d to discuss who, who understand the technology. And I think that's important because I think part of the CNCF's goals is to have projects that enrich the ecosystem and not just, you know, if, if you pass the criteria, then you're in. You know, I think it's it's been a very thoughtful process to figure out what, you know, adds and even competes you know, with different projects, what can we give the users in this environment um, that really provides something different or unique? And so I think the SIGs have really been, you know, instrumental in doing that and have allowed us to go a lot deeper on some of the projects. Um, doing the due diligence, I think Brian and Alois can also speak to this, is, is pretty time intensive. And, you know, 
Generally, it means going and setting it up, trying it out, looking through all the documentation, talking to users. And I think by using the SIGs, we're able to really put in the time that's necessary to look at these projects in depth. So um, I can appreciate that. You know, having originally, I think when we only had six TOC members way back when, um, and now we have, you know, like you said, the landscape uh, document is, is just huge. Um, it was unrealistic to have those people. And though we've grown the TOC, I think it's still, you know, such an asset to have a diverse group of co-chairs and people attending these SIG meetings to to help drive those decisions. Well, I see that Liz has just popped in um, and, and joined us. And, and, and Liz, do not feel bad at all about this. I keep, and you're, you're muted. I'm going to unmute you so you can say that. I am betting. I'm so sorry. Time zones are a nightmare. But they're, they're evil. So don't really don't worry about it. So um, what I did instead, just so just to catch you up, is I gave my final talk. Um, that was going to be the closer for the day, but we'll have to figure out some other closer for the day. Um, and you know, we're being the whole day is pretty fluid. Um, so we, we, I just unmuted after I gave my talk the folks that were going to be your AMA chat panelists. Um, we could pause here. Um, unless Eloise wants to say something quickly um, and let you give your presentation if you'd like to do that um, and we'll just stage that and then if you've got your presentation handy can you can figure can that? Can you give me a minute to make yeah. sure I've got the right one yeah so I'm then taking this opportunity to give Liz a bit more time and uh, also share my perspective I think a lot has already been said about about the process in the CNCF. And for, for me personally, it was very interesting because I was coming more from a stance background, which is a totally different level of collaboration. Um, and uh, I learned a lot. Um, I think the help, the six definitely help, uh, I think here, because they can dive deeper into topics and can spend more time, as Aaron mentioned. Um, I just sometimes feel and that when projects come in, so there's like very different maturity levels, which probably, um, the CNCF also wants. I think the biggest clarification you have to make is just like being a project in the CNCF is not like uh, like this magical moment where suddenly your community is going to change. Like, yeah. okay, we want to be in the CNCF because we want to grow our community. And that's why we want to become a CNCF project. And then as, as, as this process works, suddenly everything will happen. And this is very often when you have to provide feedback. So yeah, but so, so what are you planning to to give to the community? How do you plan to engage? Probably you have a, a louder voice than you had before, but it's, it's not going to happen by itself. It's like still a lot of work that you have to put into, you have to uh, get, get things going. And that's where I just saw like some of this, this misconception. That's why I really like this idea of like building communities and how to bring people together. Sometimes yeah. it's really about giving an audience and it's almost like, okay, I want to have my project here. And for some of those projects, the first question was, shouldn't you be talking to this guy? Shouldn't you be talking to this guy? We're like this facilitator. And then the projects come back and say, the only thing you really wanted to do is to more or less get my due diligence done. So yeah, but we're actually giving you a bit more than this, like connecting you to people who you should be speaking to or who might also be interested in what you're doing. And as, as people then try to move in that direction, we, we can see some of them really starting to, to appreciate this. I think one doesn't really replace the others. But I think the very important role for, especially that the CNCF here and, and the project is, for, also to Brian's point, like we all work for companies who obviously have a commercial invest. And for some of us, collaborating in some cases is really hard if there's no independent third parties. Because like on an everyday basis, uh, we might be more or less in the competitive situations. And I interestingly had these situations in my past where I was working with people uh, in a um, in a, a standards or a collaborative way while at the same time being engaged in the same customer engagement in a competitive setting. I think what these like independent organizations really provide is this collaboration um, for, for people and like this, this safe space where they can work together. Yeah, I think um, I, you brought up a good point at the beginning of this too, is that I think a lot of people think that 
um, if they get a sandbox or they get an incubation status, that um, some magic is going to happen about around developing a community around it. And they do get a, a larger podium, um, at, you know, and some visibility. But it's still all of the work of developing the community is still needs to be resourced and um, still needs to be part of their strategy and their planning and their roadmaps. And I think that's that's a good way to segue into Liz's talk. Mm -hmm.